Welcome to the GRN, the Growth and Resilience Network, where every episode brings you targeted stories and strategies about professional and personal growth and resilience. The intent of each episode is to educate, energize, and equip you with information and hopefully a bit of wisdom to apply in your life and within your communities. Hi, I'm Steve Piscatelli, your host, and I'm coming to you from my headquarters, my world headquarters here in Atlantic Beach, Florida. Today, we begin a seven-episode series that highlights transformational stories about community building and community sustainability. Now, each of these stories will appear in my soon-to-be-released book, uh, due out around the beginning of 2019. The book builds on seven core values for purpose and growth, and the, how these seven core values help communities grow. The values, relationships, relevance, rainbows, resources, responsibility, reflection, and resilience all connect and support one another. And when I speak of community, it doesn't always have to be a geographic location. You'll see that the concept of community can and does connect to groups of like-minded people regardless of physical location. Now, in many cases, those folks are within a location. However, the community has developed due to something, well, we might even say greater than the location. These are people who come together and grow from the support they get from within themselves and their community members. This episode focuses on one such community and how resilience was nurtured and in some cases discovered and continues to be nurtured and discovered. How do communities bounce back from adversity and how do they grow stronger? Now, our transformational story for this episode comes to us from the eyes of two forces of nature, two determined women who decided to act, make a difference. And the context is breast camp. The first woman you'll hear from is Bobby de Cordova Hanks, uh, and a very intriguing, intriguing story. You'll hear that uh, Bobby was a, a bass player um, and um, performed and traveled uh, playing the instrument of choice um, for years. And then in 1986, things changed when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she and her husband, Jerry have written a powerful book titled Tears of Joy in Sickness and in Health. A cancer survivor and caregiver share their story. Now she's going to tell us how in 1986 there was little in the way of support and how when she saw that there was little in the way of support, she took action. She created the support group Bosom Buddies and it still goes strong today. So we're gonna start this episode and let's hear right from the mouth of Bobby de Cordova Hanks, how she saw a need and took action, not just for herself, not just for her husband, but for the thousands of people who confront the diagnosis of breast cancer and start on the road to thriving and surviving. Let's take a listen. What the heck did I know about running a support group like Bosom Buddies? My background? Hmm. <laughs> 35 <laughs> years on the road playing bass. As in bass guitar in bands as in stand-up bass and symphony, or jazz bass, Latin bass. <laughs> I happen to be the only woman 
in the Encyclopedia of Jazz in as a bass player in the Latin field. Really? Yeah. Was I right in trying to form and run a support group for women with breast cancer? How dare I was what I would say to myself. But I found that there was such a need for it, Steve. Mm. There were no support groups here. And you found this, Bobby, after your diagnosis. Is this correct? Right. Well, what happened was I remember sitting in the doctor's office, and I was 50 years old at the time. Five zero. Five zero. Had never had a mammogram. The doctor never said to me, you need a mammogram. This was 1986. And sitting in the doctor's office and having him say, it's not good. It doesn't look good. It's a problem. It's serious. It's malignant. He used all kinds of words, but never said the word cancer. And that was the eye-opener for me that back in 1986, cancer was still in the closet. Hmm. It was the big C, you know. And... I thought when he said to me the prognosis of living five years, maybe, I looked over my shoulder to see who he was talking about. I thought, it can't be me. I'm healthy as a horse. And the reason I was sitting in his office was we had played tennis like we did whenever we could over the weekend in about 90-degree weather. <sighs> we being you and your Jerry husband. and I, my husband yeah. and I. And we came home and... I was so exhausted, I flopped on the bed to take a nap, and when I rolled over on my stomach, I felt something hard as a rock in my breast, and it had literally turned to stone, hmm. and I had been going to the gynecologist for a breast check every six months because I had huge, lumpy breasts. And, you know, when I'd be on the bandstand, people would come up and stare at my cleavage and say, how are they? I mean, how are you? <laughs> so it, they, they were attention getters, you know. So I said to Jerry, there's something wrong with my breast. It has turned to stone. I said, poke at it. And he did. And he said, that's really weird. You better go to the doctor. Went to the doctor the next day. Went from the gynecologist to the okay. surgeon to the oncologist, to the hospital, and facing the loss of my breast. That quick? Back in 1986. Mm -hmm. That quick. Of course, years later, I found out we don't have to rush like that. It's not going anywhere uh, that fast. When you find a lump that's palatable and you can feel it in your breast, it's probably been there for six, seven, or eight years. Mm. And even though I went every six months, six centimeter tumor, about that big. Six. Yeah. And so it was That's huge. when they found it. When they, they found, found it. Six it centimeter. was huge. Yeah. So I really didn't have a choice but to lose my breast. And I thought, why is he giving me this terrible prognosis? I thought, I'm too busy to die. It's not in my daytimer, <laughs> and no other woman is going to wear my jewelry. <laughs> and when I hit 30 years, I called my oncologist up, and I went, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> he said, I know who this is. <laughs> and I said, you know, we need something other than a doctor. I was newly married to Jerry. He had lost his wife two years before to a misdiagnosed cancer. Mm. They thought she had lung cancer when she had ovarian cancer, and she died in 10 months. So here we are, newly married, and lightning strikes again. And I said, I can't do that to this man. I absolutely can't. I had no family here. I knew no one here. He likes to say he rescued me from Miami, <laughs> and I moved up here to marry him, but I had, I left all of me back in Miami. You know, as you're, you're talking, and I can see the emotion in your face and also hear it, when a doctor 
as you said, 30 years ago, different culture, basically. Oh, yes. Okay, different culture on how you handled this. Right. How you either, in, in case, not how you say it, it's how you don't say it at that time. And someone's giving you a death sentence. Right. And you're looking over your shoulder like, not me. What is resilience? Because not only for Bobby, but when you created Bosom Buddies in 88 or 86? 88, 88. 1988. Okay. So you created Bosom Buddies, which now is 30 years old. Right. right? 30 years old. Um, as a support group, you saw a need. Um, doctors weren't even saying the C word. Um, and you were talking off mic, and maybe we get to it about the woman who came to the support group and decided she wasn't going to do therapy. She was just devastated with everything else around her and then her diagnosis. And as I read your book, Tears of Joy, wonderful book, and it's an interesting read because it goes chapter by Bobby, chapter by Jerry, chapter by Bobby, chapter right. by Jerry. And it's um, the, um, the patient and the caregiver, the patient and the caregiver. And it's... Um, it's enlightening. It's humorous. It's a punch to the gut in some places, um, but it's always um, memorable. And, and I, I was taking notes from it. And since we're talking about resilience, I'm going to go to your words. And let me go through a couple of these because I, then I wrote down, is this an ingredient for resilience? Mm -hmm. Is this an ingredient? Okay. You're, you say a few times, and then I, I believe you even finished the book with, Facing the worst, preparing for the best. So as we talk, you know, is that resilience? You talk about mind-body connection, emotional support. To me, it seems like another ingredient for resilience. And, and that there is a life after cancer. Another, it's that looking forward, future orientation, as right. opposed to a death sentence, as opposed to what it used to be. I also saw in there, in your book, uh, I just wasn't the same person I was before. My priorities changed instantly. I wonder if that's a piece of it. Um, you talk a lot about choice. You had to make choices. Um, and somehow, and this is, I think, where, I don't know if it's the DNA for Bobby or it's something you taught, modeled, mentored in bosom buddies but you had said at one point in the book i suddenly felt alive again right wow um and then you became very proactive although i would have to assume you were always a proactive person always. <laughs> <laughs> but you had said at one point in 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 the book um you, you'd learned that it was okay to ask questions and to demand answers so you're standing up for yourself you're standing up for your family. You're standing up for those around you. So is that another ingredient? Um, you need other women to talk to. Um, you mentioned the president of the college's open campus, and this was Florida Community College at the right, time. Right, that was Charles Spence at the time, a wonderful man. Yeah, and, and the seed for Bosom Buddies was planted. So you have these, I don't know if those people were mentors, but they were at least a support mechanism on an organizational level. So, you know, here I am dealing with, I'm in a new hometown, I'm in a new marriage. Uh, I all of a sudden don't have a job. They're telling me I'm gonna die. And I went home that day and for the first time, I closed the door and I sobbed like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, You've got too much to live for. What are we going to do about this? And this is you're saying this to Bobby. Bobby's talking to, to Bobby. Bobby. Bobby's to giving Bobby the old one-two talk. Yeah. And so I, the first thing was I had no health insurance. I had no income. I had no anything. Mm. And when you went to have chemotherapy in those days, you paid a certain amount of money for every session. Up front. Up front. Yeah. Or you didn't get the, the treatment. And at the end of that year, I got the most incredible bill from a pharmacy in the mail. And I called them up and I said, who are you? I don't, I've never heard of you. And they said, we supplied your chemo drugs. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, mister. You're telling me that all the money that I paid every week, week after week, 
did not include the chemo drugs? They said, didn't the doctor tell you that? I said, no. <laughs> so wow. here I am faced with these incredible medical bills. Steve, it took me 24 years to pay off my medical bills. <laughs> I paid my last payment in December of 2010. Wow. It took me 24 years. So, how do you survive that? Where does the resilience come? Is this something Bobby was born with? Is this something the mom who helped you glue together a, a broken base? Well, I came from a family of fighters. You know, I came from a family, uh, we lived in an area where uh, there were eight of us of the same religion. and we were always bullied and we had eight girls who went all through school from elementary school through high school because they hated us they bullied us so we you had were different and you had you, you had a support group right you, you had a support group this is junior high high school right yeah right and so we had to, we banded together to to survive this so i came from a family of activists my mother was very politically involved she was a feminist before anybody knew what the word <laughs> feminist was. My family was in practice together, uh, law practice. My father, from the time he was 34, he had his first heart attack. And he had six heart attacks and a stroke before he died young. Mm. And of course, what kept him alive all those years was resilience. Yeah, I have too much to live for, I have this family I have my law practice. I have so much in my life to live for. Is that a piece of it then, Bobby, from your perspective for resilience, is it that there has to be something greater than yourself to live for? Oh, yes. It is. I think, first of all, you have to believe that there's a higher power that can help you get through this. Because sometimes when your struggles and you're at the bottom of this dark cavern, the only thing you have to look forward to or look up to to help you is this higher power. And I was never a religious person. I was a spiritual person. But I found when I was diagnosed with cancer and given a death sentence, I had to have something there to look up to. When I couldn't go to my family, I couldn't go to friends, there were no support groups. I could talk to the man upstairs or the woman upstairs. Somebody upstairs. Somebody's up there, please. Somebody up there, listen. please listen. Please listen to me. And I came to understand why we needed support outside of the family because the word cancer and death was synonymous to Jerry. And I couldn't sit down and convince him that I wasn't going to die. He says, now I knew you would survive, but not in those days. Sure. I wondered if he would survive. You need not only support for the person with cancer, but the caregiver. It's just as hard. Everyone has cancer. And the way I look at it is, People notice someone in a wheelchair, but how many people notice the person pushing the wheelchair? They're survivors, yeah, too. The everyone has cancer. So everybody in that, that circle. Uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. It affects everybody. It affects your husband. If you have children, it affects the children. It affects uh, your doctors. It affects uh, your best friends. Um, your family members. I, uh, and, and so eventually what you, what you do when you're at the college with the support of mm -hmm. someone um, uh, above you in the hierarchy, right. um, you, you see this, this need mm -hmm. and you create bosom buddies. Well, here's what happened. Here's the absolute reason why I created bosom buddies. The job of news bureau manager was open at Florida Community College and I had applied. 139 people applied for the job, including some of the anchors from the TV shows, 
radio, journalists, everybody. What was I, a former bass player? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a music magazine editor, you but know? With, but with an attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but with an attitude. So at 3.30 that afternoon, the head of the public affairs department saying, welcome, Bobby, the job is yours. Ooh, at the college. At the college. Wow. To be the news bureau manager. So from bottom to top, like from in bottom hours. to top. <laughs> so after being oriented to everything that had to do with my job at the college and still dealing with cancer actively, I went to Chuck Spence, the president, and I said, Chuck, I said, we're supposed to be a community college, and there's something in the community that's lacking dreadfully mm. and badly needed. He said, what's that? I said, we need a support group for women with breast cancer like myself. There was no support group. There was no support, period. There was no education. Yeah, yeah we could get out there and say to people, poor me, I have cancer. Give your money to this society. They can help us. I started with three women at the first meeting. We've now served way more than 7,000 women. It was years ago when we kept very good records and we could go back and we had served 7,000 women at that point. Mm -hmm. Never charged a penny. Free wigs, prostheses, head coverings, weekly support groups, community presentations, everything. Right. Counseling. You need it. Come to Bosom <clears throat> Buddies. We're there for you. Was that then, do you see that the Bosom Buddies... A support group and, and support emotionally with materials and the materials could have been like you said prostheses um, um, it could have been reading material it could have been insure um, so you've got the, it was that the piece was that a resilience piece well that was an aside the resilience piece was they could walk into that Monday night meeting flip off their wig, mm. peel off their false eyelashes, sit down and be themselves and be among people who had walked the walk. If you say to me, I understand just what you're going through and you have not had cancer, <laughs> yes, I have no. one word for that. Thank you, but bull. Yeah. <laughs> Thank this you, is, but you're not I helping. Mean, <laughs> this is what used to happen. People would come up to me and say, Oh, my God, I heard you have bad breast cancer. My Aunt Sadie in Pittsburgh had breast cancer. She had chemotherapy for six months, and then she died. Thank you so much, but right. you're not helping. <laughs> so I taught everyone in Bosom Buddies the first thing is to put their right hand up right in front of the person's face and say, stop, please. I know you care about me. I know you love me. I love you, too but no negative thoughts are going to enter my brain. Positivity only. And that meant everything. You can go to any ex bosom buddies and I'll say, tell them what the, uh, you know, what the code is. They put their <laughs> hand up and go stop. My mantra, I'm too busy to die. It's not on my calendar. No other woman will wear, wear my, my jewelry. jewelry. <laughs> they can tell you that verbatim. There's a mindset, obviously. Mindset. There's a mindset. And it's interesting about the mindset because I truly believe that the mind-body connection is so important, just as important as the medical treatment. I had everything. I had crystal healing, Reiki healing, healing touch. I had every type of treatment that you could think of. And one of my favorite doctors said to me, if you're going to do all that mumbo jumbo, I'm not going to treat you anymore. I said, really? I said, why don't you look at the results of that mumbo jumbo? In the end, it's in my book where he said, people who come through Bosom Buddies and go along with all that mumbo jumbo do better than anybody else <laughs> I've ever seen in my practice. Mm. He became a believer. Yeah. So what is it? Is it the mumbo-jumbo? Right. 
or is it the fact that there were others pursuing the mumbo jumbo with you and have in the past and you believe will in the is is it that piece that helps or is it you can't separate any one it's all together okay the motto of bosom buddies is what you too i thought i was the only one hmm. that, Say that says again. it in Say, a nutshell Say that again what you too i thought i was the only one hmm. friendship is born when one says what you too. I thought I was the only one. Mm, mm. I mean, I have gone to hospice and had young women in their 20s and 30s say to me, I don't want to die. I don't want to leave my children. I don't want to die. Mm. And I have a little magic wand that I bring with me. <laughs> and I look at them seriously and I say, you see this magic wand? If I could wave it and I could make all of us well, I would, but I can't. But I can promise you that I will be here holding your hand every step of the way. You will not be alone. Hmm. Your buds are with you. I, I think it's an obvious, but I could be missing it since I have not gone through, although I've not gone through your support group. Right. It seems that a... Uh, what you have found, Bobby, with Bosom Buddies is this idea of support. Mm. The vast majority of the times is that piece that puts the, uh, the person in the group maybe over the hump, maybe gives them a little bit of something to hold on to, which becomes a big something. It becomes a very big something. I have people, Steve, who have been coming to the group for 15 years or more. Mm. And people would say to them, my God, you're a long-term survivor. I mean, why are you still coming to Bosom Buddies? And they'll say, number one, the camaraderie, the friendship of people who have walked in my shoes and truly understand what I'm going through. And the second thing is that I learn something new at every meeting which is always a good thing. And it's 15 years later for some of them. Right. Yeah, another piece of your book, you had said, um, um, I desperately needed other women to talk to, uh, especially those who had been diagnosed with breast cancer and lived to talk about it. I felt like cancer was a death sentence. Now I know. It's a life sentence. It's a life sentence. You know, when I go to speak to groups and they, and they give my introduction I always leave this out so I can say it myself and I'll go up and I'll say oh thank you for that wonderful introduction I'm so happy to be here but you left the most important piece out and they'll go what is that and I go I've earned my PhD <laughs> since my diagnosis in my case, oh, and everybody's applauding. Yeah, right. <laughs> After the applause dies down, I say, in my case, it stands for patient hasn't died. <laughs> Can you think of a better one? And what a way to start. <laughs> and, and maybe end this. Um, so before I hit the end button mm -hmm. on, on the recording, anything that Bobby wants to make sure that Bobby says about resilience, about the importance of it, um, about nurturing it, about growing it, about understanding it, about helping someone else with it, about yourself. And if you are in a situation where there is a caregiver for you about that person, anything we haven't touched on, or even if you want to go back and reinforce something. Well, you know, we, we had another woman come to the group one time and say, my mother died of breast cancer. I saw her go through it. It was a horrible experience. I'm not going to do anything. Two meetings later, this woman announces to the group, this is what I needed in my life. This gave me the piece of how I can be resilient, how I can face this, how I can be a victor, not a victim. Mm. We never let the word victim be used in our group or by anybody else. I always tell people the diagnosis from the National 
Coalition for Cancer Survivorship is from the moment of diagnosis for the balance of life, whether it's months, years, or decades, you are a survivor, never a victim, never a sufferer, mm -hmm. but a survivor. And th that mindset. It's that Power mindset that whether mindset. you know it or not, you're building resilience. The situ because that mindset is changing you. You're no longer slumped over. You're walking with your shoulders back. You're proud to be a survivor. And you're not only adapting to the situation, right. bouncing back, which a lot of times when we hear about resilience, it's the bounce back. There's right. a hardship and you bounce back, which obviously you have done, and everybody you've worked with, I mean, everything you're talking about, and you survive. But it, it, to me, as the listening, it's even beyond just surviving and especially with it's you. Thriving. It's thriving. Exactly. is the word I was thinking of. It's, it's thriving. It's, you can be a survivor or you can be a thriver, yeah. but never a victim. And every time you say the word survivor and you think of the millions of other survivors out there, you could say, if they can do it, I can do it. Facing the worst and preparing for, for the, the best. best. Thank you, Bobby. Um, you have left quite a legacy for your community. And now, Jeannie Blaylock is a reporter, an anchor for TV 12 here in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, she is the, um, uh, the winner of a Peabody Award, uh, numerous, numerous Emmys, and a few Edward R. Murrow Awards. In the early 1990s, she decided to start a program called Buddy Check. You'll hear why she decided to do that in this um, interview that she graciously um, uh, gave to me one day on her way, basically on her way to, uh, to the studio. And she met me at a coffee shop, and we uh, just uh, grabbed a couple of microphones and started talking. You'll hear some traffic noise in the background. That gives a little ambiance to this. Now, Jeannie started Buddy Check 12, and it's gone international uh, over the um, two-decade-plus existence, um, promoting monthly breast self-examinations. And she was starting it, too, at a time, a few years after Bobby started the Bosom Buddies. Um, Jeannie's starting this program, and she has to break through some taboos at the time about what can be said and what should not be said and what can you show on TV. Um, so let's listen to another one of these groundbreakers who made and continues to make quite a difference in the community. Let's listen to Jeannie Blaylock. <laughs> yeah. I just know that pretty much everywhere I go on any day of the week, somebody comes up to me and says, oh, thank you. You saved my mom's life. Or I'm checking because I watch Buddy Check. So that's good. That is. About, we've been doing Buddy Check 25 years. So at year 10, I had, start, I, I used to always count all the survivors. I'd not to give somebody a number, but your success story number 35 or whatever. And I was already up to several hundred, 387 or something. And that was Couple, half decade and a half ago. Mm. Yeah, I just lost track of all. There's no yeah. way to keep it, keep track of it. Yeah. Is it a community that you have created? <laughs> well, let me just say this. At first, there was no community. Okay. There was a lot of scared women who didn't want to talk about breast cancer and a very, very few pioneers like Bobby DeCordova Hanks. But most women, if they got breast cancer, did not want to go on TV and they didn't want to talk about it. I used to get these messages. This was way back before cell phones and texts and emails. Remember the little papers that secretaries would give yeah. you? And at the end of the day, <laughs> you'd get a stack of those on your desk and yes. they were pink and they'd say, Johnny Smith called or Joan England or whatever. And so, and usually it didn't say why. So I'd stay at night, especially on Friday nights, and I'd call all the women back, just hoping I'd find somebody buddy. who had done buddy check and had saved their life. And every once in a while, I'd wind up on the phone with a woman who said, I saw that on TV, I did a check, and I had breast cancer, but I don't want to talk about it. You know, I don't want people to know. 
And I remember one phone conversation I'll never forget. The lady said, I'm so scared and my husband will leave me. Well, that wasn't the only time I had heard that. So I was sensitive and I said, I just listened. And in the middle of the phone conversation, she started to cry. She goes, here he is. And she hung up. And that's always bothered me because I never had a chance to really talk to her and tell her she will be beautiful, even if she lost her breast. And how long ago was that? So that's, that's in the first story. couple of years of Buddy Check. So we're talking, what, 21, 22 yeah, years ago? you're in 25 now. And I just begged women to go on TV and talk about it. Then, of course, women embraced the whole idea that if you're a survivor, you're courageous, and we're going to support you. Our whole school's going to rally around you. And then there's that community you're talking yeah. about. What changed I think that? women's spunk and women's <laughs> intuition. I have to say, I don't think it was men at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I mean, the men didn't come along at first, but they're great now. I mean, yeah. I can't say enough about the men's support now. Yeah. You see Tim Deegan out in the tutu now. Right. But right. early on, I think it's just women's <laughs> guts, women's courage, and women's sympathy and compassion that their fellow teacher had cancer or their mom had breast cancer and they just rallied and said, we're talking about it because women talk, right? Right. It was a natural gift. At least women think so. Maybe well, men then, don't. But <laughs> well, I guess you move from, you talk about the C word, if you even said the C word back in the day. Um, you talk about malignancy, but you don't say cancer. Whatever it was to avoid it. And you're saying that. You gave people permission, or you maybe you didn't, but you helped people get the permission to say, I got cancer. Well, even inside the TV station, I said, look, we're not going to have breast models. We're not going to have little rubber models of breasts and show people, because I don't want to just enhance that fear of touching yourself. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to tell women to do self-exams, we're going to show a breast. You're like, oh, no, I don't think so. And I'm like, I said, you, yeah. we are going to show a breast on TV. <laughs> so it went up to corporate, which I didn't even know at the time. And they kind of said, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. But we did it anyway. We did it. Um, so we got a model. We did put shaving cream on the model's breasts in my shower at my house. And my f- female photographer um, went. And we spent a lot of time with different age women and showed self-exams on beds and showers in front of mirrors wow. um, in the most obvious open way but still couldn't show a nipple on tv because we just couldn't we weren't allowed right but i wanted to show women's fingers touching their breasts and say this is okay this is good a uh, year about the well it was the that? first couple of years the, oh, wow. so for within the first okay. two three years yeah was there a pushback 1993 or an imme- 94 yeah. 91 something. okay was there an immediate acceptance of when you post that mm-hmm. when you play that when you air that <laughs> or did you get Pushback. I'm glad you asked. I only remember getting one criticism this entire time I've done Buddy Check, and it was legitimate. A man called and said, you know, my wife had lung cancer. You're ignoring other cancers. And I said, I will try to do focus on other cancers, but I just can't do it all. But immediately people gravitated. I mean, the very first night that we did Buddy Check, 234 women called in. 234. 234, the first night. And I called my mom, who's my buddy, and I said, Mom, we had 234 calls. And she, being the motivator that she is, oh, you could get thousands. Come on, you keep going. I'm like, Mom, you know. And within not long, I mean, we, we, we branched off into testicular cancer, you know. And that brought in so many calls it shut down Southern Bell's computers one night. Did it? Yeah, that wasn't immediate. So we had to get, we had to, get to the police academy and, and talk about those tough guys getting testicular cancer. It remind cancer. me, what's... Why did you start it? I had a very, very, very good friend, one of my best friends in Missouri where I grew up. Um, her name was Kay, and she ironically was flat-chested, but that's something I've tried to tell women. doesn't matter the size. Mm-hmm. You can still get breast cancer. She was pregnant. She went to her family doctor, and she said, by the way, I had this thing in my breast. And he patted her on the shoulder, and he said, now, how old are you, honey? And she says, well, I'm 29. He goes, oh, don't you worry. You're too young for breast cancer. And she believed him. And so she went through a whole pregnancy, and she went back after she had this beautiful little baby boy. She was that that thing is still there. And at that point, they tested it. But by then, when they diagnosed it with breast, uh, breast cancer, it had metastasized, and she passed away. Mm. And I remember just being hit over the head with 100 trucks. I just I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I didn't know anything about breast cancer. Kay was gone. I was mad. I was sad. I was in tears. And yet, nobody was talking about it. Nobody was talking about breast cancer except for the fact that you have terrible mastectomies and 
you get butchered and it's a death sentence and all that bad stuff. We had to change that. That's the legacy. That, that's, that's the I mean, the legacy the that you that, created. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I was going to ask you, and I think I got the answer, but what happens if Buddy Check goes away? Now? Yeah, the program. What happens Oh, my gosh, now? I've never been asked that question. What I don't want to think away? about that. Why should you ask that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't imagine really going away because there are still so many women finding breast cancer doing buddy check. There's an entirely new generation. I just did a story not long ago asking young women, what does a breast cancer feel like? Mm. And a lot of them still didn't know. Mm. And so we have to keep giving that message so that each generation teaches the next generation to check. And I think that this, it is this, it's an intergenerational um, movement you started. And when Jeannie Blaylock is no longer doing Buddy Check 12, <laughs> it's going to continue. I mean, you've created legs for this thing. Well, I hope so. I mean, yeah. women have taken it all over the world. I had a lady stop me one time. She goes, I just want you to know that I took Buddy Check on my trip to Europe. So she whips out these photographs, and she's sitting by the Leaning Tower of Pisa talking to her tour group about Buddy Check. She packed up our Buddy Check kits in her suitcase and took them overseas. And we've had it translated. I mean, I've been down... In the Caribbean four times. I've been to Grenada. We went to Rio during the Olympics two years ago. I just went last year in May to Holland uh, yeah, to, to The Hague. Yeah, which is we, we picked that because that's an international city. So we were able to have very serious conversation with women in 21, dif- 21 different countries. So we are working hard to be international with it as well. well you're doing it. Yeah. We're trying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you connect it to resilience? You just don't give up. You never ever take no for an answer i tell my kids no means yes it's just plan b (laughs) but you know there's something about breast cancer now with men too i mean men get breast cancer some of our survivors are men this community has embraced this fight against breast cancer i mean donna you know donna was doing buddy check and that's how she found her breast cancer. She wasn't doing it for a while. And one day I asked her on the air on Buddy Check Day on the 12th. It made her mad. I said, did you check? I was live on TV. <laughs> and afterwards, she was, don't ever ask me that again. <laughs> um, but that, that helped her find her breast cancer. Of course, now her movement has been terrific in the research. Sure. You know, at Mayo Clinic and through so forth. Um, so I think this community is a leader for the entire world. And I don't think people will ever give up on the fact that there's a cure there's something right in sight. And meanwhile, we're going to check. We're going to keep doing those mammograms. That's our big project now is to get this buddy bus. I'm yeah, sure you've heard about right. that. Yep. This uh, big yeah. mobile mammography unit because only 46% of women are getting regular mammograms. So that means that almost half of women are not yeah. getting regular mammograms. That stinks. I mean, we know that mammograms pick up breast cancers, pre-cancer, stage zero, the size of grains of sand. And yet half of women are not getting mammograms. So we want to, that's another whole thing. We want to cut down on the stigma of it hurts. I don't want to do it. I don't have time. It's not my family. All that stuff is a myth. When you look at the seven R's and you're looking at resilience and this bounce back, everyone, I see every one of those, they, they connect with what you're doing. Is there one that jumps out? Relationships strikes me because I used to speak to groups and I'd say, raise your hand if you know someone who has breast cancer. And a few hands would go up. Now almost the entire room goes up every single time. Yeah. And it's not just, oh, yeah, I happen to hear that Jane Doe had breast cancer. It's that someone's walked it with somebody else. And they know. They know the day the lady had to get her head shaved. They know the tears. They know the fear. They know the worry about recurrence. They know the victory, the last day of chemotherapy and yeah. celebrating. So people understand this. It's the relationship. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it comes down, without that, what do you have? Well, that's why we do Buddy Check. It's that's staying right. alive for the people who love you. Yeah. Not so much, you know, I always tell women, when you're on an airplane, the oxygen mask drops down, where does it go first? Does it yeah. go to your children? No, it goes to you. You've you got to keep yourself alive first for the people who need you. When you look at what you have done and your team and all the people around the world for Buddy Check, if you were going to help somebody replicate Buddy Check 12, and I know you do do this around the world, but what does a community need to have their own Buddy Check? I mean, I, it. It goes beyond to saying, well, yeah, they need someone to remind them to buddy check. But to get something systematic moving like you have, 
something that people listen to, something that people know. It's a brand. Mm -hmm. What's needed? I think it's an entire plan. It's not just going on TV and saying, hey, don't forget. I mean, we are very careful. We do stories about women who say, you know, I wasn't checking, but then I started. And I felt this love, and we get very detailed in our stories. I mean, it's, it's the execution of details. Yes. So uh, the story I did not long ago, a lady said she'd been doing buddy check for 11 years. Well, actually, let me correct that. She'd been doing it for 25 years, but 11 years ago, she put our buddy check shower card, which shows how to do a self-exam, on her refrigerator. So for 11 years, she'd been looking at that, and she'd been doing these self-exams faithfully, never found anything. And then she found a lump that felt like a craisin, you know, kind of a dried-up, firm cranberry. Mm -hmm. and so we always talk about a lump being firm or hard, and every time we're consistent, we have been consistent with that message. What is a, and getting nitty-gritty, what does a lump feel like? Where's the number one spot on your breast for breast cancer? Where's the number two spot for breast cancer? Um, the upper outer, outer quadrants one, around the nipples number two, just really digging into the earthy details. Mm. And then also, we go out a lot. We speak to groups constantly. Last October, I think I spoke at 31 different places um, because you meet women who say, I did breast cancer. I did buddy check too. And they stand up and they tell the whole room of their fellow employees and see there's the link. I didn't know Betty Jo had breast mm, cancer. She stands up there in tears and said, you guys, you got to do this. I'm alive because I did buddy check. It's just that echo of the voice. It's giving everybody a voice. I mean, I can't tell you how many women I've met. I met a woman when I was in Amsterdam, and, and she said I, her mother died of breast cancer, and she's had breast cancer. She never really talked about it. And I said, you have a powerful voice. Yeah. Think how many lives you can save. So it's the nitty-gritty it's telling women to rise up and talk about it because people will honor what you're saying. And when those people get up, it makes it relevant. Yeah. This is not just a news story. Oh, it's their friend at work. That's yeah. what's important. Does that, that all make sense? Is yeah, that what yeah, you're asking me? Yeah, it makes a lot me? of sense, okay. sure. And then yeah. they, they need to take personal responsibility because mm -hmm. that's what you're really getting them to do is mm -hmm. you need to check. Yeah, and then I, don't, I, can't, I do not want to de-emphasize men. I want to emphasize sure. how important men are. In fact... When we started Buddy Chicken Grenada, you mentioned the C word. Now, this was years ago. This is back in the 90s. Yeah. And the doctors at Baptist asked me to go down and start Buddy Check. Well, they didn't talk about breast cancer, and it was called the Big C. C. Yeah. Or it was called the Beast. The Beast? The Beast. Mm -hmm. Or it just wasn't said. And if you had breast cancer, typically you went in your house and you would hide because you felt that you'd been cursed. Something you did wrong in your life is the reason you got breast cancer. And they also believe that if you go down to the local market along the ocean and put a raw piece of steak on your breast, it would draw out the breast cancer worms and then you would get rid of your breast cancer. I mean, just so oh. much misinformation, but get this. The editor of the newspaper, his wife had breast cancer. How many stories had he ever published about it? What would you think, Steve? I would say zero. You're right. <laughs> So yeah. I talked with oh. him. We got on the wow. radio. We got on the TV station. And this gets back to the men. They came to me and said, hey, there's a lady who has found breast cancer. Would you like to talk to her? And so I did. And she and her husband were there. She, she heard about it on TV when we had started Buddy Check on GBN, Grenada Broadcast Network. And she said, oh, my goodness, you know, thank the Lord. Thank God I'm here. And, her, and I said, well, what did it feel like? And I asked her husband, he goes, well, when I felt it, and he, went, ah! and he got embarrassed. I said, sir, you saved your wife's life. And that's what the amazing part is. That took is. guts for them to do. That took guts that for them did. to do. But I felt yeah. like really with this whole thing, just my personal belief is, you know, God guides all this stuff. You know, that he's the one who's giving me an idea of talk to this person, talk to that person, go here, go there. I mean, that is my map. Yeah. That's and my map. Somebody, Melissa Ross had told me when she did a podcast with me, talked about weak, the power of weak ties. Mm -hmm. And you never know. It's just, you know, something mm -hmm. you don't particularly know somebody, you don't know them well. And it's not manipulative. It's just you never know where it leads. You well, never you know hope. the impact. Yeah, it's not manipulative because you're hoping for good. Yeah, exactly. Jeannie, I love you. Thank you. Oh, well, Steve, <laughs> I know you have a passion about this. So thank yeah. you yeah. for including all of this and reaching out to people. Somebody could pick up the words that you put out there, either through your blog or your book, and that could save their life. We toss around those words all the time, save your life. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's enormous, enormous. enormous. It means mom's there at Christmas. Exactly. It means yeah. dad's in his chair. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. You make it real. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
have it, folks. Thanks to Bobby and to Jeannie for taking the time um, to share their thoughts, their passion. You can hear the passion. You can hear why they started and the difference they make. Um, you can hear that they saw a need and they acted. Now, folks, thank you, the listeners, for joining us today. With, without you, there is no Growth and Resilience Network. Uh, I thank you for sharing our podcast with family, friends, colleagues, and community leaders, and especially a program such as the one we did today. What a powerful episode. Uh, visit my website, stevepiscatelli.com, for more information about upcoming conversations. We've got six more in this uh, series uh, looking at these seven R's seven core values for purpose and growth and how they connect to com com community building and sustainability. Um, and a quick note, you will also find um, for each of these podcasts coming up, uh, there is always a little sneak peek. I give you two or three, sometimes four sneak peeks very quick about what's coming up in the one that will be released that month. So thanks again. I appreciate you uh, being with us until we meet again, either virtually or somewhere in person around this great nation. This is Steve Piscatelli from my world headquarters here in Atlantic Beach, Florida, reminding all of us to choose well, live well, and be well. Continue, just like Bobby and Jeannie, continue to create, share, and savor powerful moments. Bye-bye, folks.